So we'll start with variables. Something easy. Now, if you literally write down the definition of variable, it's some, something that's able to vary. Uh, but we're going to just write the definition as uh, it represents a changing entity. Of course, our entities have to be quantified, so you could think of it as a changing quantity. And equations. So equations uh, represent relations between variables. Uh, and their derivatives. Well, we'll leave that definition right there for equations. Now a differential equation. So it's obviously going to represent relations between variables and their derivatives. That's what differential equations are. Uh, you did a little bit of differential equations before. We did a projectile problem where we started out with some information about the acceleration. So basically, we start out with information about the second derivative and then took an antiderivative or an integral and then took another antiderivative and integral to basically get the original position function back out. Uh, so we're going to do things somewhat similar to that. So we'll start out with an example. Now this is a biology example, so I'm going to write some words. I really don't know what they mean. Living organisms. Contain. I know what contain means. C12 and C14. Uh, but C14 is radioactive. And that uh, means it decays over time. Oh, something changing over time. It sounds like a DDT. So let's think of variables here. So <clears throat> which of these two uh, quantities are changing? The amount of C12 or C14? C14. C14. So I didn't necessarily say in this sentence that C12 is constant, but we can clearly tell C14 is going to be changing. So that's what the sentence basically says. So C14 is uh, changing. So we're going to uh, use a variable. Now we're going to use a lot of x's and y's, just and t's when we need to. So let's go with x. So the amount of C14. Now what would be misleading if I just wrote C14 is x? So I could have a problem with yeah, naming, but if I just say C14 is X, that's kind of like saying water is X. Like you probably want to talk about the amount of water or some measure of the water, not just the water is X. Uh, there's some times where we kind of abuse this, we just say the height is X, even though we're probably talking about like the height in inches or feet or something like that. Uh, so you want to be careful, just make sure you're measuring the right property of whatever uh, 
whatever entity you're talking about. So the amount of C14 is X, and then T is going to be time. And then depending on what units they give us, we'll determine the units for the amount and the time. Uh, so we're going to suppose that decomposition has a linear relation to the amount present. So this word decomposition, <coughs> what that means is how this is going to decay over time. So it's basically describing a rate using slightly different uh, words. So it's describing our rate, how the amount is going to change. So that'll be dx over dt. So that's the change in amount over time. And it's going to be related to the amount. So it's not necessarily equal to x, but it could be a multiple of x. Uh, if this is supposed to decay, or basically decrease in amount over time, uh, we could say k is negative, or we could say k is positive and then put a negative sign in front. Does k just represent an integer? Uh, well, a real number, not necessarily an integer. It might be like 1.7 or oh, okay. something like but that. Uh, this is supposed to be decaying, so I know the rate should be negative. Oh. So I can either I can either say k is less than zero like this, or I can say with a negative sign k is greater than zero, like that. Uh, now this is to have a general linear form you need another you need a constant at the end so plus b but what would be the rate of decay if we had zero amount zero, zero. so that our y-intercept would be zero in this case or our constant would be zero here so if we got no c14 the rate of decay should be zero so we don't have a constant term in here so another way to say this the rate of decomposition is proportional to the amount present. So in other words, All right, solve for x. Well, one thing I can do to solve for x look, x is by itself. Why is this not really solved for x? Is the so we still have some x derivative on the left side. So <clears throat> what I want you to do is solve this properly. Uh, step one is let's get all the t on one side, all the x on the other. So fractions suck. So I'll move my dt to the other side. We're treating this like a fraction. So I'm going to move. I'm going to multiply by dt to get out of there. Now I want to get the x on the left side. So we got one over x dx equals negative k dt. So now I want you to solve for x. What do you have to do? It's a calculus move, not an algebra move. Integrate. Integrate. There you go. Remember, as long as you treat both sides the same, and you do whatever you're saying you're doing correctly, you'll get an equation that's also equal. 
All right, so go ahead and solve for x. You'll probably have a function of x, and then solve all the way for x. So it should be, the integral should be very easy to do. What I did here is mostly correct. What's wrong with my constants? They're the same. So we need one constant on each side. So let's uh, get x by itself. So remember, just like algebra class, you're just getting rid of all x as friends. So I'm going to get rid of the constant first. So remember, you're going, when in doubt, go up PEMDAS ladder. All right, so we're almost there. Uh, we got two constants subtracted. What do you get if you take one constant and subtract it from another constant? You get a new constant. So let's call it C. doesn't matter. So you could be positive or negative. I didn't make any assumption on it here. All right, last step. How do I get x by itself? So I take the inverse log of both sides, or the exponential function, however you want to think of it. So we got x equals e to the negative kt plus c. And I'm going to write this as e to the negative kt e to the c. What is one constant? Now I'm looking at e to the c. What's one constant raised to another constant? Wait, is it, is it plus e to the c, or is it just multiply? Multiple. So I did the uh, a, b, that rule. So I got one constant raised to another constant. That's the third constant. So remember, these are not changing, so it's just some number to another power, but they're constants. So I'm going to let a equal e to the c, and then a is also constant here. So we got x equals a e to the negative kt. Did I solve for x? So x is by itself. There's no x derivatives or anything to do with x on the right side. So x is in exactly one spot by itself. So this is solve for x. Uh, this is the rate of decay equation. It's probably one of the easiest uh, differential equations to solve. So now we'll put in some uh, values. So let's suppose k equals uh, 0 0.01. And the 
the T units are going to be years. When x equals 200 units. So we have dx over dt equals negative kt, and we have negative 0 0.01 times 200, which is negative 2. So let's think about the units that this is in. All you need for the units, you just need to look at the left side. So what units are we working with here? So it's definitely per unit time, uh, but what, so, <coughs> yeah, so it's amount over time, basically. So in this is a change in amount over time. So here we'll have units. I didn't really write down what units are we're using, but units per year. So that would be the units we have here. Uh, for example, you can use grams. It's a good metric unit. So this is basically how many grams per year uh, you'll lose based on the amount. Let's go back to our original, uh, already solved for x. x equals a e to the negative kt. So let's suppose c14 decays at unknown rate, so we don't know k. Uh, but we did take some observations. We have 100 grams of C14. At t equals 0. And we have 10 grams of C14 at t equals ln 10. So I think LN10 is somewhere around 2 or 3, I think. Uh, so let's figure out A and K. All right, we have an equation that relates X and T. And also, of course, A and K, but A and K are constants. So we're going to plug in X and T values to figure out A and K. So we're going to plug in the initial conditions. We can write the conditions as points. So if we write them as points, uh, let's put our independent variable first. Is x independent or t independent? What is the independent variable? Uh, t. Is it x or t? I think this function is one to one, so it could go either way. But the way it's written, it should be t is the independent variable right here. So if I know t, I can figure out x. So one, another way to write this, x equals a function of t. That would be another way to write this. Now I could solve for t pretty easily. Divide by a, take a natural log, divide by the negative k. So this is a one-to-one -one function. So technically, both variables are independent. But the way we're writing it, the uh, t is the independent variable, or the input variable.
So when I write my points, I'm going to go t first, x second. So first coordinate, set, second coordinate. That's why I'm ordering it x, uh, t first, x second, instead of x comma t. So my first point is 0, 100. My second point is ln 10, comma, 10. So those are my tx and my other t, my other x. And now I'll plug in the first one. So figure out A and then use a second, uh, the second point or second data point to figure out K. You should be able to get both. A is pretty much right on the board already. But figure out K with the other point. I'll give you 30 seconds for that. Probably. So A is a hundred. So we got X equals one hundred E to the negative KT. So I'm just plugging in our A value now. And now we'll put the second point, which is LN ten, comma ten. So X is ten. 100 e to the negative k ln 10. All right. Oh, details. How in the world do we deal with this? We can get rid of the 100. So let's examine this piece right here, what can I do with a constant in front of a log? I want to move it in. So coefficient turns into a power or an exponent if you push it inside the log. What I want to have is basically e to the ln of something. So I can cancel the e and the ln. Uh, there is a second op algebraic option I could do. I'll write it down, but I don't really want to do it because I don't think it's going to get any better. Uh, so I could write this as 100 e to the negative k raised to the ln 10, but I don't think that's necessarily the way I want to go here. Uh, powers of powers are products, or products of powers are power of a power. I kind of want to go the other way, so we're going to do we took care of the 100, so this is ln of 10 to the negative k. And now we get to cancel these out. So e to the ln cancels, and we got 10 to the negative k, and I just rewrote 1 tenth as 10 to the negative first power. So what happened here is those cancel it out. No, 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 well, I was talking about the 
the K that you just do right as L N L ten to the negative. Reason that rule. <laughs> yeah. All right. So k is one, and we're gonna write down the final version. X is one hundred e to the negative t. Gotta have that in the brain at some point in time. Oh, this is a right Yeah? All right, we'll do one more decay problem. Half-Life. Very good video game. Half-Life of Radium. is 1600 years. So this question <coughs> Uh, we're assuming this has the same type of decay as before. So that means x is a e to the negative kt. In this problem, they didn't explicitly tell us what k is. Nor did they tell us the initial amount. So the best we can answer with how much will be lost is talk about a proportion. So. If I ask you this question, if half-life is 1,600 years, how much will be lost in 1,600 years? What's the answer? Half. We don't know how much we started with, so if I start with 1,600 grams, I have 800, but maybe I start with 20 grams and then I have 10. So the best I can say is, oh, we lose this percentage or uh, this proportion of it. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have 1,600 years, so we can't just answer it without doing work. But I can say it's going to be less than half. We will lose much less than half, because it's a whole lot shorter than 1,600 years. Now, how much less than half? We'll figure that out. Uh, so we have a choice. We can basically choose the amount we start with. I think an easy amount would be either 1 or 100, meaning you start with 1 gram, and then we'll see how many grams are left, or we start with 100, thinking about 100%. And then we'll think about how much percent is left at the end. So let's go with A is 100. <coughs> I'm going to choose A to be 100. So let's go ahead and use the first piece of data. Half-life is 1,600 years. How in the world do I turn that into a T comma X? How do I turn that sentence into a data point? So 1600 definitely will be the time. What are we going to use for the amount? So how much should we start with? So 100%. So what should we have after 1600 years? 50%, which is 50. That's why it shows 100. So this would be super easy when it came to cutting 100 in half. So it'll be 1,650. So we got half the amount in that amount of time. All right, so go ahead and solve for T. So it should be pretty much just like the last problem.
I'm just going to solve for negative k because when I plug it back in, I have negative k in my original equation. If I look back, what I really want to do uh, is figure that part out. So I don't need to solve all the way for k because I'm about to plug it in for negative k. Yes, it should be the reciprocal of what I wrote. Absolutely. <laughs> I think we could clean this up a little bit. 1600 doesn't look like a coefficient, but it is. What is 1600 if I read it as a coefficient of ln of 1 half? 1 over 1600. <coughs> so this will be 100 e to the ln of 1 half to the 1 1600. Oh man. Now we're going to cancel the E and the LN. So we got one half, or the 1600th root of one half. Ooh, where did my T go? That's not good. Okay, T. Uh oh. So it should be T over 1600. That's what happened. Yeah, I left out, I just wrote it as e to the negative k, when it's really e to the negative kt. So t is just another coefficient, so it's just basically t over 1600 is our overall coefficient. Alright, and we want t, we want to know about 100 years. So when we plug in 100, we're going to have the percentage that's, uh, we, that's remaining after 100 years. So now we're going to plug in e is 100, and then figure out what x is. That would be 1 16th. So I know one of you guys has a calculator or a phone. So just take the one half, we need a sixteenth root of one half. N times a hundred, yeah. We're pretty close to a hundred. Should be a little bit less. So that's an approximation. Alright, so that's how much percentage is left. So a little bit above ninety-five percent. Uh, because I don't know, that that was an approximation for the 16th root of 1 half. If it was 2 to the 16th power, we have an exact answer. But the 16th root, I don't think as a finite decimal approximation. All right. Uh, is that reasonable? That's another thing you have to think about. So we had 1 16th of the amount of time to take it to half. So it seems somewhat reasonable that we'd have about 95%. I was betting closer to 90, but that certainly is reasonable. So your book was written, I think, in 1968? Really? Yeah. <laughs> you had differential equations for a while. Not a new thing. Calculus is 300 years old. Your book was, your calc book's not 300 years old, but calculus. there are calculus manuscripts that are that old. Uh, so there are some weird notations that your book uses. 
So I'm just going to write down uh, interval notation your book's going to use. This definition in 2.1. I'm going to try to uh, refer as closely as I can to the actual d number definitions and things in the book. So it should be definition 2.1. Our interval is defined to be, and they actually use less than or equal to with the double equal signs, which I personally like. There isn't any. They were just, they had the less than and equal sign, like both literally printed out one above the other before uh. somebody just decided, well, do we really need two equal signs? Technically, no, so we can save a little ink. Uh, so that obviously is the same thing as closed at A, open at B. So interval notation is basically the exact same as you're used to. So we got one last definition. A function of one independent variable. Give me a definition. So two variables. Are related in a way such that the value of one We'll just say y is uniquely determined by the other. So for example, x. Then y is a function of x. So this is basically a way to uh, think about an equation as a function. So for example, y squared minus x equals zero. I could write this as y squared equals x. Oops, I meant to go square the x, not the y. So if you know the x value, you know the y value in this case. Even though the first equation is not written as explicitly a function of x, it's very easy to see that y is a function of x doing a tiny bit of algebra. So basically, if you can solve for one of the variables, you can say that that variable you solve for is a function of the other variable. If I have something really similar, y squared minus x squared equals zero, I can do the same algebra, uh, except now all I can say is y is either x or negative x. So in this case, if I know x, I don't necessarily know y right away, and vice versa. So in this case, neither is a function of the other.